Okay, so I think we can um, we can start the, this Erostruct live talk. Uh, this is a first of a series of uh, of live talks that Erostruct uh, just uh, launched today. And uh, for those that are not aware, Erostruct is a European Association for Quality Control of Bridges and Structures, and uh, this association came up from. Uh, uh, previous uh, cost action called 1406 on quality control of uh, roadway bridges and um, you can get more information about this association on our website and the idea of these talks is to cover some relevant topics that we as a uh, civil engineers and structural engineers mostly we are dealing with uh, both from academics to practitioners and uh, this way I think it's uh, it's very relevant to start uh, with our first talk with uh, with uh, Professor Rade Aydin, which was one of uh, of the organ mentors of Cost 1406. So uh, I think it, it was uh, uh, very important for for starting this talk. So we have with us Professor Rade, and also uh, the person that is moderating with me. Uh, Irina Stepanovic, which was uh, the leader of working group two and also another mentor of cost, in, cost action 1406. And uh, I hope that in the next hour we'll be very happy to discuss some, some issues, but also there are some roles. The first one, I will gonna ask you to turn off your, your, uh, your cameras. This is a matter of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, Wi-Fi connection and so on, uh, and also your micros are turned off, as you can see. Uh, if uh, your if you want to put any question uh, to during the discussion and so on, myself and Irina, we're gonna see it on the on the chat. You need to put the questions on the chat. And uh, and uh, in the in in we we are seeing jointly the chat from Zoom and also in Facebook, and we will place this question to our uh, esteemed guest. So uh, I hope that you enjoy, and uh, this Euro Strikes Live talk. And now I will ask Irina to present our our guest today. Hello, everybody. So today the speech will be given by Professor Rade Haydn. Uh, Rade has a PhD degree from ETH from Zurich and uh, after seven years working in a private industry, Rade uh, was appointed as visiting associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania. From 2003, Rade is the president of Infrastructure Management Consultants, uh, which is located in Switzerland. And Rade is also a visiting professor at University of Belgrade, responsible for PhD mentoring and consulting public enterprise roads of Serbia. Rade is very active in professional societies, chairing a technical committee for civil and geotechnical engineers in, at the Swiss Association of Transport Professionals, also a long-term active member of TRB, YABMAS, IAPSE, AAC, um, American Society of Civil Engineers, and also ISO 55000 at the Swiss Committee uh, for Standardization. So this is a short introduction. If I missed anything, Rade, you can of course add. And we wish you a very good speech and also to all the participants, we hope it will all work well and we can chat afterwards. Um, Irina, thank you very much for the kind introduction. There is a slight, uh, difference there. I'm actually a full professor in Belgrade, not visiting, but uh, this is okay. <laughs> and uh, I'm going now to share the screen. I hope you guys are going to be able to see it. Um, if you don't, please uh, react. Uh, um, this is, of course, the premiere for Eurostruck to have a live talk, and I hope that you can see my screen. Uh, I would appreciate if Jose and Irina can confirm that, then I can actually start. It's really a pleasure to, is it okay, I Irina? Confirm. Yeah, yes, okay. yes, confirm. Um, it's really a pleasure to have opportunity here to present some thoughts on the lesson from bridge collapses. Of course, this is a little bit of classical theme, a classical topic. Uh, there it's, it's been said that you learn more from the collapses or failures than you learn from the successful designs. 
which is probably overrated statement, but nevertheless, we can do indeed learn something about bridges and uh, our procedures uh, within, a, within a bridge construction operation and retrofitting with regard to the bridge collapses. Now, I'm going to restrain myself to the minority of bridge collapses which are during the service. So I'm not going to talk anything about the collapses during construction, although there are a majority of collapses uh, that we recorded until today. There is also a database on that, so you might also look into it and see that the construction failures are majority, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the failures during the, during the service, which is in, in some view also from the TU 1406, because we there deal dealt with the, with the existing bridges. Now, my talk is going to be structured as follows, and I hope this is going to work, yes. After a short introduction, I'm going to pick up three recent failures that during the service, I'm going to talk about the inspection practice and perhaps some of the deficit of the inspection practice today. And finally, I'm going to go to the conclusions. Now, if you talk about uh, failures in a service, the mother of all these failures is the one that is here presented. Uh, we are in June 14, 1891, and there was uh, this failure of the railway bridge near Basel. Münchenstein. That was a wrought iron bridge commissioned in 1874, damaged in the flood of 1881, repaired and strengthened in 1881, 1890. Look at that. 1890 was strengthened and 1891 there was a failure. 73 people died, unfortunately, and the cause of this failure was the buckling of diagonal members in the middle of the span. So not there where the forces are the largest, but on the contrary, where the forces are lowest in diagonal diagonal members. So this buckle, and you can see here probably in this picture, this particular member, well, I, it's probably going to work, yeah. This particular member here, that's the one that actually buckled first and then later on the whole structure buckled on the other side as well. So this is something that, uh, uh, that was the beginning of looking into the failures. And of course, we did learn quite a few things from these failures. First of all, we learned that we have to do something about that. And uh, the, the Swiss parliament or Swiss, the Swiss government was very fast. In 1892, they produced the ordinance on calculation and testing of iron bridges for Swiss railways. And this was actually obligatory, or was compulsory uh, ordinance that should be used also for design and also for the testing of the bridges. And testing here could be, could be, could be understood really also inspection as well. Of course, there was also political backlash the political backlash was that the people were that talking in the national parliament about nationalization of railways, something that we today also may have heard about uh, when something happens with regard to the to the, our infrastructure. It didn't happen in the end. Uh, the railway stayed private, the one. But then after that, some serious work has been started, in particular on the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, where Professor Tetmeyer was investigating buckling behavior of this particular bridge. And you probably all know about Tetmeyer's, uh, Tetmeyer's line here, which is presented here as well. Oh, I'm sorry for that one. So this one here. This line here, there's a famous Tetmeyer line, and this, of course, is a Euler buckling curve here as well. So this was uh, really something that we learned about that. The, the phenomena of buckling was not well understood until then, and based on this failure, we learned a lot. Now, can we learn something from the recent failures? In the same way as we learned back then from, the, from this failure. Now, we are going to talk a little, a little bit of that, and there are some differences what we can learn and what we cannot learn. Now, the recent structure failure that I have chosen that are maybe not so arbitrary, but and nevertheless are quite famous. Of course, the first place is August 2018, Polchevera Viaduct in Genoa that uh, failed in on August 14. The second one is November 2019, suspension bridge over Tarn near Toulouse in France. And the last one uh, during also this corona crisis in April 2020, bridge over River Magra between Carpiola and Albiano in Tuscany in Italy. Now, is, are this failure, do we learn the same, can we learn the same thing from this failure as from the one in Basel? Is it some new insight to structural behavior? And I don't think so, really. 
the causes are well understood and these bridges are not so complex and now none of the phenomena there we are really new with regard to the failure so what went wrong what happened there why we have happened to get these failures was it possible to predict these failures that's a nice question here and according to inspection preceding the failure the condition of this bridge was good all three of them actually also the same thing happened in Münchenstein where there was also a retrofitting and after that there was inspection that everything was fine. So maybe something there is not quite as it should be. Let's begin the, 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 the simplest one of these three. That's a special bridge collapse in Mirepoix sur town in France. It was built in 1931, it was renovated completely in 2003 and it was nicely posted to 90 tons, metric tons of course. Now, what happened there is very simple. The, the cause of cover was an overweight truck, allegedly over 50 tons, so that's a gross negligence, and allegedly the same truck passed the bridge several times. So that's, that's the owner of the truck that said that. So anyway, there was something wrong also with the perception or a respect toward the infrastructure if somebody 50 tons go over the bridge 90 tons. This also changed uh, in attitude of our population, also changed regard to infrastructure, which we regard as given, as granted. And then for that reason, we use them as we wish to do so, without regard to the, to the posting. That has to be changed as well. Now let's go to the more complex one. The Porchivera Viaduct was constructed in 1967. The stays of two remaining pylon, pylon one pylon has actually collapsed, well, are structured in 1990s, and you might see here in this particular picture here, this strengthening here. In 2017, and that's very significant, the uh, Politecnico di Milano had a report and uh, indicated some suspected behavioral state of the collapse pylon. I don't have time to go into detail here, but that's something very important because the eigenfrequencies of these of this, uh, states change quite significantly. The inspection performed in February 2018 didn't impose any instructions, but in all fairness, we have to say that uh, the owner of this, of this bridge decided to make an upgrade and they tendered it in May 2018. Now, they, they were unlucky or, uh, about that because the bridge collapsed on 18, August 14, 2018. The last one, the newest one is the bridge over here in Magra. It's constructed in 1809. It was partially destructed in 1945 and it was rebuilt in slightly different design in 1949. One thing which is significant here, the concrete slab was added to the structure in 1919, depleting probably safety margin. And from 2013 onward, the, the population around these two cities, uh, well, they observed quite a few of cracks uh, on this particular, pay, on the payment of this bridge. The inspection performed in November 2019 didn't reveal any structural deficiency and the bridge collapsed on April 8, 2000, 2020. Okay, so these are the cases here. Now, are there something wrong, as I said before? Are inspections actually useless? Now, we had all these three bridges. There was inspection beforehand. Now, let alone the tarn, which was overloaded. The other two were inspected on pretty much within a year of their failure. So is there something wrong with our inspection practice? What do we do in, in, in inspection practice? Current practice essentially is documenting damages, which are pretty much only deviation for as new condition. And there is a finally qualitative assessment of safety and serviceability, if at all. Now, I'm not talking each particular country in each particular practice, there are also differences there. But overall, I think it's fair to say something like that. The structural properties, in particular safety margins, code loading, which was used during design procedure, result of structural analysis, robustness in particular from design phase, this is all knowledge from design phase, are rarely consulting prior or during inspection. Of course, they are consulting in an in-depth investigation, but this is something completely different. This is much more a costly, costly uh, activity. This information that I said here needs to be readily available in a structured manner. We have today digitalization. We have all kinds of computers databases. This information has to be on your fingertips. Inspection process, on the other hand, needs not to change much. But inspection results need to be properly interpreted based on the previous knowledge. So there is a con conjunction between the 
previous knowledge on our bridge, the official identity card of the bridge, and the and inspection findings. So inspection are not useless, but they have to be used in a different way. In particular, we got to robustness. Now, when we are talking about these bridges here, opposed to the last two as particular, both Porchevera Viaduct as well as the bridge over Marga are really not robust structures. And I'm often being told by several people, my colleagues in particular, that the structural concept of both bridges are now heavily criticized for good reason. And I can agree with that. But let's face it, uh, the bridges that, are, that have served well for 75, 51 years, they shouldn't be just thrown away because their concept is flawed or their concept is heavily criticized. They can be used further on when they, when they are treated properly. So the, the reason uh, of not being at back then in a structural control that's not, uh, not good enough is not reason to, tell the, to say that these bridges are useless. They can serve very well if they are treated well. Now, if they, there's difficulties with that, we can replace them in the, in the due time without letting them to fail. Structural system of both the bridges are quite simple. They are more or less isostatic. And the vulnerable zones that can be triggered over the failure are commonly known. And this particular case is the Torchera we do with a conflict state, so one member fail and everything fails. And the same thing is the bridge over Magra with the elevated arteries. And maybe some of you are not uh, familiar with this last failure, but I'm going to show you what happened there in my view. This could be wrong, but we can talk about that later on. Now, this is a bridge over Marga, a cause of collapse. I'm going to discuss a bit of it. A failure of the first or second morphobly arch of the side of Capriola is actually the cause of the failure. I think it's the second, but uh, we can discuss about that. The additional slab, maybe, I don't know, but maybe the pressure line was outside of arch core, which is significant enough. And the movement of badness of both sides could also give some additional horizontal force. The cracks on the, on the, on, on the, in the pavement may induce something like that. Now, my suggestion here is that this bridge failed here in this red point here, okay, due to combined compression and shear. And this part of the arch just fall down. Now I'm going to go further on, just fall down like that, right? Now, there was no equilibrium with the horizontal force of this arch and also of this arch. So this arch also fell down and this tilted. Now there was no anchorage in, this, in these columns here. This column tilted, actually uh, freeing the other horizontal truss to tilt as well here and this arch is also fell. So if you look at the final picture of this one that yeah, fits pretty nicely. So this part of just fell quite vertically down and this part of course was still connected to the to the tilted column, if you can see here. Now, this of course is not very good if one element is making a progressive failure, but nevertheless, one should take care about this bridges as well, and every sign of the distress should be taken into account and compared with the structural system and the robustness of the same structural system. Now, this is not only a deterioration that is our problem. We have more often than we wish to we have a problem with the change in actions. Now, the axle loads and the gross vehicle weight are steadily increasing. We have to face that. We are not going to change that. We can probably somehow deaccelerate this, this trend, but this is not going to change in the future. Also, the number of special transport that acquire permits are rapidly increasing. So these transport, at least in countries that I know, they are not special anymore because they all the time they be asked for permits. So, they are going to stress our bridges. We have to do something also with law enforcement. We have measured some of these way emotions and we've realized that the, the legal limits are yeah, passed by, by, by large margin. And finally, the climate change increase of steam and both in intensity is the need to be taken into account as on existing bridges. So it's not only about collecting damages from bridge, it's about the whole picture and we have to somehow make a inspection 2.0. There is a need to inspection 2.0. And I'm, I'm coming to the conclusions. This inspection 2.0 needs a one-time effort before starting inspection to collect the structural information related to bridges, structural system, safety margin, loading, vulnerability, and robustness. This information needs to be on over fingertips. 
it cannot be that you go to archive and look for some old plans and this kind of stuff in order to get this information. This has to be there. This is all about digitalization, finally. So the BMS, Bridge Manager System, the most got to use this and its database component has to be accommodated accordingly. And this is probably a, good, a great job to be done, but it has to be done if we want to have a safe infrastructure in the future. And the impact of damages or any other change for that matter must be properly evaluated. And that can be only done if you have an inside knowledge of your structure on your fingertips. Finally, I think that the current trend toward being can prove to be quite useful to this end. With regard to that, and I think my time is uh, okay, you can confirm that or not. And of course, I'm ready to take any question you have. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Rave. Uh, it was uh, it was indeed a very very interesting uh, talk, and and uh, a very important topic that I believe uh, uh, for all of us. I will start uh, with uh, the first question, but uh, I would like to inform everybody that uh, you can place your questions on the chat. So the idea is that if you have any questions, you should place in the chat. And uh, myself and Irina, we will uh, do these questions directly to, to, uh, to Professor Rave. Uh, so the first question that I want to, to place to, to, to Rave uh, is uh, the following. Uh, according to your presentation, uh, this means that uh, uh, owners and managers of bridges, they are investing too much on looking for uh, some elements which are not so critical as it should be. And uh, sometimes they discard or they may discard what they should know or they should know previously as uh, critical elements or in other way around, are they not considering the, the, what was the concept of these bridges during the design and so on? Well, uh, I don't want to, of course, to criticize the inspection practice. I think that these people are doing a great, great job. Finally, we have quite a safe infrastructure here in Europe and most of the owners are doing a great job. But indeed, uh, everything can be improved. And uh, I think that uh, the current inspection practice is not, uh, is not taking into account all the knowledge that is available about the, about the infrastructure of the objects. And now I can understand completely why the people are doing that. I mean, the cost and time pressure are so high that a lot of people are just going to inspect the bridges, uh, uh, taking care of the damages, putting them in a database and even evaluate them. So they're, they're looking for the, and in most cases, structural system is quite obvious. Uh, but in some cases, it would be probably valuable if they can have easily available information about the thinking that has governed uh, this bridge design in the past, and maybe some flaws of this of this design if they would be be uh, be uh, recorded in a manner easily accessible to the to the inspectors. So this is actually my pitch on the whole on the whole story. It's not a criticizing of infection process, which is uh, in most cases quite good but it's also you know, enhancing, enriching the inspection processes with the, with the information that is readily available. Okay, I can maybe if, okay, because I immediately continue. So I wanted to ask you actually, how do you foresee future inspections? Meaning you mentioned digitalization of bridges. So, and you said now enhancing the inspections with the already available in, information. So can you tell us what, which precisely information you think it's most important or how the inspection well, should be enriched in the future? Well, the most important information is of course the, the, the loading we use in, a, in design phase or in verification phase, if there is some kind of, uh, of the later recalculation of the, of the bridge or re structure analysis, reanalysis of the bridge, then this information should be clearly uh, recorded. So you have to know what kind of the action has been taken into account in order to design this bridge. This is something that is probably quite easily can be done in the in the most of the bridge management systems and some of them even do have that. The second thing is of course a structural system being used. I mean 
of course, there are different different software and different input data, but we are doing a quite a significant uh, effort to standardize this, this uh, how to introduce structural system. And this can be also in a structural way put into the, into the database. But I think the most important stuff are also called vulnerable areas. So that, that give insight of the inspector where to look uh, when they are doing inspection, which kind of damage can be really significant. Now, I'm maybe with regard to, to Bridge of Magra, uh, I have did quite a lot of studying of these pictures. There, there is indication there was something in on the on the foot of this uh, arch. There was some damage there if you look carefully in this picture. So this kind of thing should be alarm already that something should be done because this is really vulnerable area. The payment which has been investigated is definitely worthwhile investigating, but the crack in payment is only a symptom. It's not actually the thing that is going to produce a failure. May I don't know whether that's okay. your question. Okay, thank you, Rade. Uh, again, uh, for those, I know that someone put the the hand in, a, but you need to to use the chat to place the questions. So, if you want to place any questions, please use the chat. Uh, another question I want to 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 do it for you, Rade, is the following: um, We know that we all live in a very uh, special period now. Uh, and uh, one of the bridges that you shown was a uh, uh, collapse during this period, especially in, in Italy, that was uh, fortunately was one, one of the most affected uh, countries in, in Europe. Um, my question is, uh, uh, in terms of, of, uh, of, uh, of inspection practices and investment on the management, do you think that um, there is any impact or any correlation between the period that we are living nowadays and uh, and the the needs for inspection because I, I believe that from the owner side there was a little bit uh, some kind of um, safety measures that they they did not uh, proceed with uh, some of the inspections that were supposed to do because of of the the situation we live do you have any 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 numbers or any in terms of of uh, of, uh, of uh, practice about that or are you referring to corona right to the, yes, to the pandemic corona. situation yeah yeah I, I well actually the no, opposite uh, i mean the, the given that you, the if you inspect bridges you are outside of the of the cities and somewhere in in a, in, a, in a area which uh, which you can maintain the distance of two or three meters actually we did, did didn't at least this country didn't affect uh, inspection procedures at all uh, on the contrary there was some exploration with regard to that i think it was also a good idea to do some repair work during this corona time but i didn't experience myself and i'm not aware of that somebody actually just postponed inspection because of the corona situation that's yeah that's what i can say about that <laughs> um but uh, I think there is another thing that should be taken care of. I think that the respect uh, for the infrastructure uh, from the 1890s uh, or the, 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 you know, the founding times of our industrial uh, nations uh, actually went down slowly toward, the, toward our time. And, uh, and we take, most of the people take infrastructure granted that the one that, that, uh, that happened in town in France is really showing a, a a negligence, even disrespect toward toward the infrastructure. Um, yeah, that's what my pitch on that one. Okay, Irina. There is a comment from colleague from University of uh, Eiffel uh, on We in Motion. Is it? I'm just reading it right now. Maybe it's. Uh, so, after the collapse of the Mirepoix, uh, if I read it rightly, bridge in France, we are considering to speed up an ongoing program planning to implement direct enforcement of overload by V in motion. There are quite a lot of progress in V in motion for a direct enforcement in several countries and above all in the EU. As Vice President of uh, Science uh, of International Society of V in Motion, we plan to push forward the, uh, that act that activity or that initiative. That's very uh, good, yeah. Yeah. 
And it's the same thing is going to happen uh, probably in this country as well. We are now working also on a research project with regard to the to the loading and uh, way emotion is very important this way. I think it's uh, it should be enforced and also the fines should be much much higher than they are now. Yeah. Okay. I also have here another comment uh, concerning the potential of structural out monitoring systems in terms of monitoring these vulnerable areas that you just uh, mentioned and in the uh, optimal situation uh, how a digital twin of all the bridges could be used in order to automatically evaluate such data well i think that beam or a digital twin as you said is a very very important development and uh, if you look into the ifc uh, effort it's also there that you can you can also model the structural system, which I find very, very useful. Um, however, uh, said that, I don't think that uh, uh, the structural health monitoring connected to these vulnerable areas, if properly applied, is very valuable. And uh, this thing uh, should be pushed forward, in particular in the cases where robustness of our old bridges, and they are still okay, uh, is in, 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 in uh, robustness low. So this is something that I think is very important. However, I'm a bit skeptical with regard to these automatics, right? It could be done, of course, and there should be maybe even in some cases it's be use, useful to have automatic alarm if something going on. In some countries, they already have that. But uh, with regard to the damages that are not uh, impact, have a direct impact on failures, a careful look by, the, by a structural engineer would be also quite helpful, I believe. Okay, so we have a next question from colleague Mufai Buhari. I'll try <laughs> from Japan. So the question is, since there are so many old bridges around the world, each bridge should undergo this for structural audit or inspection, which is kind of time consuming way. Is there any modern technology to overcome that problem? Well, actually, I tried to say that if you if you structure data in the proper way, this this effort can be can be significantly reduced. Now, the one of the main points, and we do that all the time, as in if you go to the archive and look for the data, you lose probably 30% of time of the overall time that you need to to reevaluate the bridge. So, if you would have this structured data uh, on on your fingertips, on bridge management systems, something like that, you can significantly reduce this effort and also you can make a triage you have sort out the bridges that are robust and you don't care about that anymore and look for the bridges that really can can uh, can pose a threat to the to the society so i think this is this is something that uh, that can help a lot yeah okay Rade. Uh, there are uh, here also one question concerning the bridge in genova we all know uh, about, uh, if you could provide also some more information about the term, with respect to corrosion and so on. But I, I will also, to add this, to this question, one more thing. We know uh, there was some similar problems with, um, again, with a t similar typology bridge in Venezuela, which were used the same, the same typology. Um, why? Or will it much more be, be fruitful if we could exchange some of this information among the managers and operators? Because uh, I think it would be, if we had this information uh, beforehand, I think we could, we could avoid, uh, or at least we could go directly again to these vulnerable areas uh, and make a more uh, strict monitoring on these, on these zones. So if you can speak a little about uh, Genova and, and, and how can we use previous information from near faults and, and even faults for, for, for the, the, those bridges that we have in our stock, it will be, it will be interesting. Okay. Um, well, maybe first, first uh, regarding Genova. I'm, of course, uh, this is something that I only, only read. I did, I have some, my own opinion on that and I have to constrain myself to things that I that are maybe very proven. There was a corrosion in a, in a stays. There was also some cracks in a state that are supposed to be fully, fully pre-stressed, which is in itself a kind of a warning sign. There was also these measurements for Protecnico di Milano, which uh, uh, which measured the lower lower frequencies uh, in the stays. So this all these signs are quite clear. 
Now the, the, the direct uh, cause of failure, one can speculate it, yes, it could be that the, the stay start to vibrate in a wind and this of course then produce a fatigue failure. But I don't think that it really is so much important. We shouldn't have been that far at first place so that we are, we are you know, kind of dependent whether there is a storm or no storm. Um, that's, that's the issue. So with regard to the, to the exchange of information, I think uh, that the good structural engineers do know what our vulnerable place is. There are very few structural systems that we don't understand fully. Um, there are some, of course, but there are very few of them. And in particular, the old bridges are, we do understand them. So it's more about identifying them uh, and, and putting them in the right, right perspective together with inspection, putting them together and figure out whether there is a danger or not. Uh, the exchange information about failures is a very tricky one. It's a sensitive issue. The people don't want to talk about that and I can understand that very well. I was moderating back then in Structural Engineering International, YAPSE, a journal I was moderating the session of lessons from structural failures. And I can tell you this was a very hard job to get to get any information whatsoever. So this is something that people don't want. And also there are the legal implications, this kind of stuff. So this is the things that people are not very really ready to exchange and I can understand that. But after some time, like for example, Münchenstein Bridge for 1891, now we have all the information after the legal procedures and we can understand what's going on there. But I don't think that our big problem today is that we don't understand structural behavior. We just don't use the full information in order to figure out that something can happen. Okay, we have a next question. So based on your experience, or have you seen any case of failure in the joints connected by bolts? Or do you know if it is a common case compared to the other cases? I'm not really an expert on, on steel, right? So that I, I cannot do much. But there, there are quite a few, of course, these failures. Silver's bridge in, in US uh, in 1967, that actually was triggering the, the NBI initiative, right? Was one that, uh, that, uh, that this uh, I bar with a bolt actually uh, was uh, failed. So this, this, this one I know. There are quite a few of these things as well with the uh, old bridges, in particular riveted bridges that, uh, that have a failure, but in itself, very few of these bridges fail because of one rivet that, that failed there or a bolt. So I, if, if that would be the case, that is indeed a very, very significant thing that should be inspected if you, have a, if you are reliable only on one, on one bolt. Uh, another question that uh, is here is about the inspection 2.0 or the digitalization and so on. Uh, is there any asset managers actually using inspection 2.0 as it should be and in or really well and, and in your opinion who, who are in the right way uh, according to your experience? I don't want to throw names, or, but I think that, that there are some significant effort in, in, uh, in uh, Holland, uh, also Germany, and also here in Switzerland. Uh, I, I know the Austrians are also going in this direction. So there is, there is some effort the, along these lines, uh, but this is not complete, it's not exhaustive. I don't have insight in all other administration. I'm not talking about research. Research is a different story. I'm talking about mm. really, really authorities. Uh, so I'm, I cannot say, say for sure. I know that in Japan there is a quite a few, few effort, quite a few uh, work being done in this direction. So we are moving toward it. I'm, I'm quite confident this is going to happen in, in a due time. And again, back to the to digital twin. I think digital twin can also help to this regard. We have one comment uh, about the Polchevera bridge. So uh, a colleague agrees that the point, it is also the point about the robustness and how structural system is selected. So for example, in Polchevera viaduct, it has been difficult to evaluate the condition of stays because they are quite unique. It's not a question, more the comment. Yeah, they, they, are, they are unique, uh, but nevertheless, I, we, don't, I, we don't want to criticize. That's what I say. I, I don't like this, uh, these remarks. Well, this system say uh, your concept is flawed, the concept is not okay, or uh, that's our heritage. 
and we have to keep to our heritage. And you know, if there are also bridges from medieval, medieval times that also kept some flaws, perhaps, and we are we are sticking to it, and uh, that's what we have to do as well. Uh, we have also here a, a question concerning the Magra Bridge and the cause of collapse. Uh, how do we know that is not uh, undermining of the foundations? There were some movements on the boot, on the bootments and the bridge pyres uh, tilt. So the bridge the bridge pyre tilt the one that they tilt that are quite clear due to the failure. The one that didn't tilt was the one of the first piers being done in Italy, to my knowledge, that was a that was pneumatic uh, caisson. So that's a very, very strong pier, uh, that one in the, in the river itself. And uh, the problem with that was, of course, that, 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 the, that the column on the, on the foundation, which is the caisson foundation, yeah? uh, pneumatic caisson, which, uh, you know, that doesn't move at all. Um, that, uh, the, that the pier itself was not anchored. So th this was just, you know, a, a masonry. And this actually produced the movement, right? So the, the middle pier, the one that we are talking about, first moved toward left and then moved to right and then stayed put. Where the other one, the other pier, all other piers toward the site of Albiano actually tilted. Maybe it's a good moment to, uh, I don't see any question there, so, but it uh, triggers me uh, when we are talking about the abutments and foundation. I know you have done some work on scour, so there have been significant failures, also you didn't mention them, but uh, significant failures of bridges due to the scour of... That's true. Yeah. So, and as far we have done some research in some projects, uh, also the inspection guidelines or standards regarding the scour inspections uh, or detection are quite weak, uh, we could say. So what would be your comment or suggestion? And it seems one of the most important actually failure mechanisms. Yes, well, uh, you're completely right. If you, if you look at the statistics of existing bridges, so the bridges in service that failed, then the majority based on the on the New York DO, New York State DOT that collected data on the bridges, not only New York State, but also US and worldwide, the majority of them are due to the hydraulic action. Hydraulic of any kind, not only scour. And the scour indeed is, is a big problem. And it's a, if you compare, for example, scour as a, as a, as a, as a cause of failures and compared to earthquakes, you will see the scour is much higher. So we have to do something about that. Now, I do believe that the inspection, scar inspection can be improved and they are done mostly in most countries. So they are very, very, uh, they're quite an effort to, 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 uh, to find a scour. Uh, but also there, we have to distinguish between the foundation that have piles or caissons, which are very deep, right? Uh, and the one that have a shallow foundation. I would concentrate, of course, on shallow foundations. And the most of old bridges, existing bridges, have shallow foundation, unfortunately, because you can remember that the, the caisson itself is a very expensive way to do to do foundation. It's also very dangerous for the people working in it, as you know. So that's the reason why uh, why there are not very many of them. So most people try to do shallow foundation, also uh, the newer bridges, and these are of course susceptible to scour, and there the inspection has to be done on a regular basis. Otherwise, we have a problem there as well. Uh, there are here some questions and can I, I think I can resume some of them mm. uh, about the, the, the importance of course of using uh, NDTs and especially the GPR or ground presentation rather and also uh, there is another question about the using of social monitoring systems uh, how this can be beneficial for uh, for the owners, for decision makers, mostly now because we have uh, uh, so ship uh, systems and sensors that can be much more easily implemented than than in the in the in the in before. So, what is your opinion of using uh, this kind of uh, technologies? I'm all for it, actually. The, the also also the question of the value information. I I wouldn't go that far to invest a lot of money in the frame bridge which has a span of three meters, right? I would go for it in there where really it matters. 
But I would put in the first place, I think Vim or, or the monitor way, monitor way motion on the bridges, not only in the payment, on the bridges itself is very important stuff. And we have this technology now, and this is something that, that can help a lot to understand where are actually the failures. I would, for example, that's my, my suggestion, I would measure the rea reactions in the, in the support, in bearings. I will measure that anytime possible because these, these things can be measured and you can, uh, you can uh, of course, uh, you know, trace back the forces uh, where they go through by knowing the reactions. So this is something that I believe was the first thing. There are other things that I believe are very important, uh, in particular the one that you mentioned, um, uh, structural health monitoring generally, putting the strain gauge in the right place, uh, using ground penetration radar, in particular for the slabs, where they are, of course, the, the susceptible to failure. Uh, these all things are very variable, and uh, but we have to watch out that they also themselves need some kind of maintenance. If we want to be sure that they deliver us good data, we have also to maintain them. So this is also issue that should be taken into account. There is also power supply issue, this kind of stuff that you all all know, people and. Uh, uh, this is everything nice in research area, but if you want to do it uh, 20 years uh, in a row and uh, don't take care of them all the time, but just measure, then uh, there are some other challenges to be overcome. Okay, we have another question, which is, uh, I think we have done quite some effort in cost uh, to 1406 in that regards. So how do you envisage the, in the future the cross-agency approach uh, or uh, in Europe and standardized approach towards bridge inspections and can we expect that it will be unified in the near future and also can we apply the same uh, methods to inspect road and rail bridges and also different types of bridges? Well, to be quite honest to you, I don't think that the, uh, I don't know what you think on the short term, right? Uh, but if you if you're thinking about a, a decade or so, uh, I don't think this is going to happen. It's going to move toward this this goal. Um, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, their their entrenched practices, and some of them are really not bad, and uh, people are not very uh, eager to change them. So what I firmly believe is that. Uh, we are going to move toward it, right? There is going to be slow progress toward enhancing database, enhancing our knowledge about the existing structure, collecting new data, and finally we are going to reach that phase that uh, you know the inspectors, qualified inspector, can have on their fingertips all possible threats and all possible uh, findings that has been done in the past, including structural system, and based on that decide upon what should be done. No, this doesn't mean that we we should keep uh, old structure uh, at any price, not, not at all. It means that we have a good decision to be made before something happens, right? And uh, so I don't think it's going to be fast, but it's going to happen in due time. Ave, we spoke uh, before about weight in motion. Uh, there is here a question concerning if uh, the technology that we have today uh, is it enough to get the OIML certification for a way in motion, uh, uh, especially for uh, overload enforcement? I think it is, yes. I think, I think that's what I know about way in motion. I know quite a few systems with way in motion and uh, I think that they are in prime time. I don't think so, yes. And the other question uh, before I uh, pass my word to Irina is about the digitalization. We all know, of course, that, um, that there are many projects around uh, concerning the bridge the digitalization, but, uh, and the digital twins, especially the, using the digital twins. But the question is, uh, what is the uh, state of art or, or what needs to be done in order to, uh, to start applying the digital twins in, in practice? Well, uh, first of all, we need a clear standard. I mean, that's uh, an IFC, I think it's uh, something that is going to be used. Now, IFC it's, itself for bridges is still not there. I mean, there, there is one version that is coming out, but this version is, for example, not treating at all damages and, uh, and also even sensor data cannot be really 
put into into the IFC in a proper manner. So this is something that has to be has to be developed. Uh, there are also other things, for example, semantic information that we have in bridge management systems that are not really transferred to the to the IFC. So there are a couple of projects going on now in the, with regard to infrastructure, mostly roads though, not bridges, that are dealing with it. I mean, the, one of them was Interlink that has been finished and now we are, we are working itself. I, I, my company, ourselves, we are working on the, on the research project together with the German colleagues on the, on the IFC usage for, for, for bridges, for, for roads and bridges finally. So there is a lot of work to be done. I mean, we have, uh, one side, the asset management system in developed countries, they have a lot of a lot of data, semantic data, mostly alphanumerical data on, on assets. On the other side, we have the, the three-dimensional models, which are mostly BIM, and these two things have to be put together. And I think uh, that there is a there is a trust today. There is a huge movement toward toward this goal. Okay, another question was about the responsibilities, uh, I think, regarding uh, the assessment and making decisions. So should the solution be maybe a dual responsibility? Uh, That's a very, very good, a very sensitive issue, right? Um, <clears throat> one of the things which is with inspection is there is a, uh, because it's qualitative uh, assessment, right? There is really not not much responsibility behind that. Um, uh, that's one of the things. So you're not really telling uh, that uh, in inspection report you really find something that people say in four years this bridge is going to collapse, because they, frankly speaking, don't know. Uh, so by by making uh, assessment with regard. To, with connecting to the structural system and to the structural analysis and also to the, to the damages, you have to take a stand as an engineer and say, I, it's not responsible for me to this bridge to stay like that, it has to be done, or you say, no, everything is fine. So this responsibility as well as for design of the new bridges has to be with the engineers. I'm, I'm sorry somebody doesn't like to hear that, but nobody else can do that. It's not a matter of politicians or somebody else uh, that uh, to decide upon the technical issues with regard to bridges. And about the dividing responsibility, yes, uh, it's in responsibility is di divided already by the fact that if the engineer doesn't have enough information, that some information is hidden or not available, of course, then the owner, as it is in the in the legal proceedings, the case, the owner has to take uh, its part of responsibility as well. No, there is also here one question concerning the existing models for structural deterioration in order to predict the lifetime uh, and to avoid the collapse event. How liable and uh, what can we expect from such models nowadays? Huh. Uh, good one. Um, you know that currently we are when we are talking about deterioration, we are dealing with the so-called statistical models, right? So we have what we have currently is condition state, and then we have a you know a lot of data from the past on 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 on, on condition state, and we try to fit this data. Uh, of course, this does this is not very uh, very easy because these data uh, are scattered a lot, and of course they are subjective in this, to a certain extent. But nevertheless, they give us a, a vague idea uh, how long does it take uh, for, for a bridge with the vertical damages that can be observed uh, until it should be put out of the service. Now, I don't think that this is good enough. I think that we have to, to really assess each particular damage with regard or symptom for that matter. Symptom is not a damage, symptom is just telling you that something is going on in the structure. Uh, symptom damage, we have to figure out uh, what is going on and try to model that uh, by physical processes or, or, or chemical processes. There was a lot of work on that. However, this work was uh, being uh, mostly on the, on the corrosion reinforcement or corrosion steel and being rather localized. So we have somehow to use a method to, to figure out the impact of damages and also the future development of damages with regard to serviceability and safety. 
Uh, and this is a challenge, I believe. I mean, one of the things that is also quite interesting, uh, to my knowledge, there are not very many tests being done on damage elements, girders, slabs, and so on. That would be kind of interesting for the academia uh, to take damage elements and to see what the really are uh, load carrying capacity of these, these elements. I know some, of course, but not very many. Okay, the, there was an again a comment from Bernard Jakob regarding green motion and that uh, the technology actually is ready. Uh, but the, the problem is that legal metrology frame, I would say, around the countries. So the international uh, standardization or body will support moving forward. I, I, I'm, I'm quite confident that there are a lot of people pushing that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, maybe if I just wanted to continue regarding your last comment. So what you actually are... Uh, suggesting is that we should do actually really individual inspections of the bridges. So we shouldn't do generalization in a sense. So we had bridges built, uh, let's say, after Second World War, 50s, 60s, and then mo many bridges would not satisfy uh, today's requirements of Eurocode regarding the loading. So uh, many countries are, I think, now very careful or afraid that they will have to close a large number of bridges because according to the code requirements, they are not satisfying. So what would be your response or advice regarding that? Well, definitely not. I mean, the, the, these bridges are valuable. They are doing their, their service. In a lot of cases, they can even carry higher loads. So we have to take care of, re-examine them, reassess them, re-engineer them if possible, and to figure out whether they can adapt to the, to the current loads. That said, means also that we have to uh, customize also load, load models. It's not, it cannot be like that, that one size fits all. I mean, they are, they are, we do know that the alpha coefficient of Eurocode are wildly different, different countries. And uh, so that's a good reason for that because the traffic is not, is different as well. So uh, that's also reason why wave motion is very important because up, using wave motion, you can figure out what are really loads that the, that the bridge, that current bridge have to carry. Designing new one, there is not a big deal because the, the, uh, the cost, the additional cost of making to be according to the Euro code, the alpha values of 1.1 or even 1.2 is not a big deal because it's not going to be much costlier. But with existing bridges and, you know, interrupting traffic, you have really to deal with the current state of affairs. Rade, uh, we are almost in the end. I'm going to place one question, then Irina, and then uh, uh, I will uh, finalize with the last uh, question and with some information. Uh, my question is uh, about uh, the, um, the the problematic of the of the hazards of the extreme events that we have also facing all over the world, uh, but uh, there, there is here a colleague from India uh, saying concerning the, 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 the problem of, of the marine structures, or in other okay. way, marine structures, or, or the, many, the bridges which are close to the sea, oh, and maritime. which are uh, maritime. Yep. maritime, because they do not only have uh, the problem of the storms, but also they have the problem of a big uh, chloride and corrosion process. Uh, what measures, what precautions should we need to, to, to take care uh, in order to, to overcome these, these uh, situations? Well, as you probably know, Switzerland is a landlocked country, so <laughs> we, don't, we don't have sea. Um, but, uh, so I cannot really tell for sure, but I, based, uh, I, I think one of the issues also with the seawater is that it has also sulfates, if I remember well. And sulfates are, of course, very dangerous for the for concrete, not for steel, but also concrete. So one thing that that uh, should be done is to protect this structure as far as possible. But now we are talking about new structures. It's quite easy because they are not quite easy. It's it's easier because you have to you can hydrophobe them. You can put some kind of coating, and this is not so bad for a current being. With existing structures, uh, I don't think that you 
that you take, can do much because uh, this aggressive aggressive environment is going to harm your structure one way or another is probably the best thing to do is to figure out what is the optimal time to replace or or, or to make a renovation of these structures that's that's kind of issue but for that you need to have a timeline you have to know what is the service life how far you can go without endangering people uh, what was your next uh, question was that was one right oh the the, the yeah. uh, extreme events well uh, we are probably going to face the uh, in stream events that are both in intensity and frequency are going to be to be higher um, that's what the people are saying uh, so maybe our our design codes uh, should be should be adapted accordingly and also for the existing structure so the existing structure there is no difference between new this structure with regard to the extreme events so that we have to take take into account i mean uh, there was uh, uh, quite a few of this, and one was in Duero, as you remember that. Uh, and this this thing can can happen happen over again. I, I don't think that we are that we can have one size fits all solution for this stuff. It has to be done for each particular. We also to to coordinate our work, which we do in our Horizon Project survey with meteorologists, with also with the geologists. We have to work together in order to figure out what are the dangers. Irina. Yeah, I think, I mean, generally I'm reading the last few comments and the questions. I think we have covered it. So again, the comment and the question was about the subjectivity of the inspections and uh, that even the experienced experts could give the different evaluation of the structural behavior or assessment. So I think we have covered, so you rather, if you want to comment that and then the Colin Caprani also commented that actually the most important, the missing link is in all our work is between the condition state and the adjustment to capacity, which I think you already very well. I, I actually, in, I actually addressed that. That's what I said. The impact of the of the damages to the structural capacity. This is something I think that there is a, there is a potential for research as well. With regard to subjectivity, well. You see, the, one of the nice thing about introduction, maybe I'm not talking about the future, of course, introduction of BIM is that you can place damages exactly where they are. So if you have a 3D model, and I'd have a student which, who is working on that, I hope he's also listening to me now, which is good. Now, the, you can, of course, place your damages exactly where they are. And if you do that, then you start to being objective as well. So now somebody else can, can take a look into it and say, well, I don't think it's going to be like that. It's going to be like that. Now, this is now a uh, discussion between the experts and not anymore, you know, whether it's condition state three or four, right? So this is something that I think can increase, increase objectivity as well. Uh, uh, last question. Uh, and then uh, I, I think I can uh, say Irina to put uh, the, her last question and then I will do, I will provide uh, some information to everybody. So my question is more about uh, what we did in cost. We did a lot. Now uh, we start Eurostruct. Uh, it is one year ago that we launched uh, Eurostruct. Uh, what, in your opinion, should be done uh, as a next step in, in terms of, of what we did in cost, in terms of quality control of bridges, and what if you need if you need to to numerate the most relevant things that you need to do further. What, in your opinion, should be done? Well, I think uh, that I, I, as I told you also before, I believe if you're talking about Eurostruct, it should also really focus on upon the the inspection assessment procedures right this is something that there is a place to do something about that i mean there are other organizations doing that as well but we can also maybe um, uh, you know offer courses with regard to inspection as we did in the cost action and perhaps uh, you know search for the possibilities to show what can happen with the uh, with the structure if you don't do the right inspection procedure so this is something that i think we can do that also with regard to structural health monitoring and the proper and effective and efficient use of the structural health monitoring uh, devices i think there is a huge uh, development in this area and we are going to face in the future 
really you know uh, good priced uh, solutions that we can give, get much more insight with regard to structural behavior of existing structures yeah. so that would be me my view would be the focus uh, i don't think that we should uh, really focus ourselves to design okay irina last question yeah i think it rather covered really a large uh, number of uh, questions and topics and uh, i i think you also my question was about how do you see where we should put the most effort in the future which you just said in the last sentence so i let let you jose close i think we have done a lot of questions and rather okay <laughs> So, first of all, I would like to acknowledge Irina to be here with me today. And uh, have a, uh, it was a very interesting presentation about a very relevant topic and we covered a lot of issues. I know that many questions are now arising, but we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, cover all of them. But uh, for sure, uh, it, was, uh, it was very, very enthusiastic. And it was also very good to see a lot of friends here together. So it was a possibility to join all of us. Uh, some they were very active in also in cost action. Some are new, but a lot of colleagues are here today. Uh, I would only like to share with you our next uh, talk. Our next talk will be on um, uh, next uh, Wednesday. So on the 20th of May at uh, 2 p.m. CAT, and our uh, esteemed invited speaker will be Rafael Sachs from uh, uh, Israel. Actually, he is in, in Cambridge, and he will speak uh, about uh, the again digitalization, BIM, and so on. Uh, I hope all of you could could attend, uh, and we will go to start disseminating the the talk uh, today. Also, uh, I would uh, like to, to inform you, we were discussing about Eurostruct and, uh, and the training. Uh, from if the COVID situation allows us, from September the 2nd to September the 4th, uh, we, we Eurostruct will organize a training school for inspectors, similar to the one that was done in, in Prague and in Thessaloniki with the participation of Professor Rade Aydin and, and myself, among others. And uh, the, the, this training school will be in Dublin, in Ireland. And uh, of course, we are uh, more than invited to register and attend and uh, learn uh, about uh, inspection, better inspection procedures. To finalize, uh, I would like also to inform you that uh, next year, from uh, 29 of August to the 1st of September, we are going to uh, organize the first conference from Eurostruct that will be held in Padua. Uh, it will be uh, also uh, launching the information about this conference in Padua in Italy uh, very soon in our, in our website. So once again, many thanks to all of you to be here and special thanks to our esteemed guests, Professor Rade Aydin and to my colleague Irina. Thank you very much and see you next week. Thank you.